meeting of January 9th to order. And the first item is approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. And seconded. I'm going to just reorder a few things. Uh, number, uh, number nine is, uh, yeah, number, number, number 10 is going to be what is now number 11 and number 11 and 10, 11 and 10 are changing. Basically. Right. So, um, is there anything else anybody would like to to make comments on about the agenda changes? No. What's that? I'm not sure. Did you say we're not doing the tenor? Right. Okay. Oh, postponed. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Ten is postponed, and nine and eleven are switched. So is eleven. The ones we're swapping is 9 and 11. Right. The library in Middlebury Regional EMS. So the library is coming before. So library is 9. And MRMS is, is Essentially 10. 10. We're waiting on and the we're property yeah. transfer. There we go. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I think we got that straight. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Next is uh, approval of the consent agenda. I'll move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. It's going to be seconded. Anything anybody would like to comment on or anything else about the consent agenda? Congratulations again to Bob Wells. That's pretty impressive. <coughs> and. Um, Big thanks to the police department and the, the wastewater guys, right? Or mm -hmm. I should say wastewater employees public for the works. toy. Public the, works. Oh, public works. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. For the toy drives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is Bob going down for the presentation? I don't have a confirmation, but I hope so. Right. He has that nice new car, electric car. <laughs> it was taken a couple and of stops. He has, he has funds for training and stuff like that. Pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, I hope he I hope yeah. he goes. Hope go. I hope we get pictures too. So definitely some noteworthy things being done by our town staff. Uh, and if anybody's out there watching it, uh, I encourage you to go to the packet and read about it. Uh, hearing nothing else, all in favor of approving the consent agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Next is citizen comments. Is it anyone here for something that's not on the on the agenda? And is there any hands up out there? I don't see it. So okay, we'll go on to uh, candidates for appointment to the Means Woods Board of Trustees. Put your name down here, Kathleen. You, did you as a presenter? Okay. Um, we. Do have candidates? Uh, Stephen Ralph is on. If you'd like to meet him, he is on the line, so I could let him give him permission to talk. Stephen, would you like to go ahead as a candidate uh, for the? Uh, I, I just, um, I guess, I just want to give back to the community. I, I had an associate degree in forestry, and it's for I, I you know, said in my statement, uh, I've done work with the Appalachian Trail and. We also had a section up on the Appalachian Trail and uh, a little bit west of uh, Charlottesville. Um, so I've done that type of work. I also was a licensed land surveyor in the state of Colorado and I did mapping for the federal government in combat support. Pretty cool. Are there any of the other candidates? Uh, or are you? I'm here, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amanda Warner. Yeah. Um, I was, I'm at a point in my life where I'm able to give back to the community, so I was looking for something that I thought would be applicable to my experience. For those of you who don't know me, I have a lot of trade experience. I grew up on the Warner Creek farm. I have a lot of practical knowledge about tree health, invasive species, soil management. I have less experience with being on a board, but it's something that I'd like to gain experience in. Great, thank you. But I, 
I kind of had a question for for each of these candidates about like what they see as um, as projects or the future for recreation in the Means Wood. If you want to speak first, that'd be great. Yeah. Can Steven speak? He's still, still here. here so hey, thanks. I, I, I've walked the camp a couple of times, and uh, it wasn't until I got onto the Middlebury site that I found out that I read the deed and, and a couple other documents. And there is, I guess, about four or five other trails back there, um, which I, I just have, I don't know where they're at. Um, but what I did see on the cam was is that there's a lot of roots showing. And I've seen this in the Newport News Park where they use fluorescent paint to now paint every roof or paint, paint the ones that stick up the most for somebody to trip on them. Hmm. I also noticed he had some uh, deadfalls hanging up in the trees um, that you know, probably should come down when people start wandering back there. Um, uh, I did notice that, that in the, one of the documents it said a, a possible revenue source would be uh, uh, cutting firewood back there. Um, has that ever been done? Does anybody know if that's ever been done? It's right. It, it could be on the border. It, cutting the firewood it could be the, the border owner. They, they have uh, sugar woods uh, right beside there. I'm not sure. I'd have to see where you're. Well, it, it, it was actually in the deed saying that that was a possible source of revenue. Oh, source of revenue. Or, I'm sorry, I missed the... Was to, to, to cut trees for firewood, and I was just curious if that had ever been done. Because it doesn't look like that forest had been thinned, you know, as far as I could see off the cam, yeah. for quite a long time. Yeah, that, I don't, not in my, not in my history, uh, 50 years or whatever, around there, I've never seen that. We used to do. Well, they, that's one well, of the they, things I'm. I'm on the on the uh, committee, so I'm not going to vote on on the candidate for this because uh, I'm a member of the committee. But uh, the funding that is an issue for maintenance of that. <coughs> I guess I don't think we've ever discussed the possibility of, of raising funds for the maintenance of that. So. I believe that the the, um, the track gets three hundred dollars a year to That's maintain from the city to maintain the wood. Um, now, whether we could possibly get you know some some people in there to selectively cut for firewood, that might add additional revenue. Um, the other thing is is that I, I live fairly close to Mead City too, and actually I live right across from the development that's going on. Stonegate uh, Meadows Development, and they had, had talked about having some way to access the camp, uh, which would be, I guess, something coming up in the future that would have to be looked at. Sure. And probably, probably the best way would be uh, underneath the power lines. Right. To avoid, you know, creating a new trail for the wood. Great. I uh, I appreciate both those answers. I think they were. Excellent. Thank you, educator, and um, I guess that we're lo looking for a, a um, spirited citizen here to do it. But who do you, who do you know we have Cindy Hill, who is the conservationist. Okay. And we have um, John Murphy, who is the educator. Say again? John Murphy. Yeah. So we can only appoint one. 
Correct. So <laughs> my proposal to you is to nominate all of these people uh, tonight okay. and then appoint them at the next one. Okay. So we would typically do this? For the competitive positions, yeah. Okay. Well, if you are considering cutting in there, you ought to look at logs first before firewood. Mm -hmm. That's not a consideration we've talked about at this point. Yeah. I'll and tell you there's board members who have a real issue or there's committee members that I don't want to spend all night talking about it. Okay. Yeah. You know. So our candidates are Robert Wheeland, Amanda Werner, Leon Smith, Josh Bodish, John Bodish, sorry, and Stephen Rowe. So I'll make a motion that we nominate all five interested candidates. Do I need to say anything else? Or is that good? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Amanda, this is the way we normally do it. We, we use it always nominate and then we wait two weeks for the thing. <laughs> I love you, Neil. I think okay. you. <laughs> Okay, next is... Uh, thank, thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. same, same to Stephen, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Oh, there's Victoria. She hasn't missed one of these yet. I was looking around to see where she was. <laughs> okay. Um, in accordance with 24 VSA section 127-1302, the board is conducting a public hearing to take questions and comments from the Middlebury community regarding the proposed FY25 general fund budget. In a moment, I will turn the floor over to our town manager, Kathleen Ramsey, who will lead off with an update on revisions to the draft budget that have been made since the board's last discussion. After her presentation, if you have a question or comment regarding the budget and would like to address the select board, please raise your hand uh, if you're here in the audience or raise the, the virtual hand and once acknowledged uh, the, the uh, ad address, uh, if you're here, come forward to the mic, uh, say who you are and address the, the subject. Um, there are okay, any questions? If not, let's turn this over to Kathleen. So uh, the first part of the presentation, the changes since the last draft, last draft there haven't been any changes. Uh, looking for some input on the budget um, as proposed and reviewed by the select board at the December 14th. <coughs> We can uh, bring up the line item budget if you'd like. Um, the budget is up about 5.3% uh, and the tax rate overall is up 5.1%, uh, uh, 4.3 cents um, reflected in the proposal. We, we can review any aspect of it that you'd like um, or open it up to the floor for input. So since this is the public hearing portion, I think we'll give any of the public the opportunity to question. Is anybody here for the public review uh, of, our, of our town budget? No, uh, Victoria, would you, uh, you're, you're usually our, <laughs> our most loyal and devout citizen in, in holding us accountable on our budget. I would, I guess, entertain having you come forward into the screen and, and okay. hit us with your questions, yeah, if you could. Panelists, then. Right there. <coughs> Thank Hi, Fred. I, I see your hand, and we'll get to you uh, after we um, 
chat with Victoria for a sec. Victoria? Yeah, okay. Um, there we go. There now, can you hear me? <laughs> we yes, can. I can. Okay. The wind is blowing. I don't have great internet, so I apologize if I uh, freeze up on you. Um, thank you. Um, glad to be back again. Um, Kathleen kindly met with me this afternoon and uh, explained uh, about the uh, surplus and using the um, the option tax and the. So I'm I'm mostly uh, just having. Some um, line item questions at this point. Um, it uh, seems the whole thing seems, you know, pretty straightforward. Wages and benefits, <laughs> and, and capital improvements. And one capital improvement I'm wondering about is the uh, seventy thousand dollars for gravel roads. And in the in the capital improvements budget, it said uh, paving and gra and gravel. And could you? So I'm, I'm Emily. Em Emily is going to be joining us. Uh, Emily Sherrington, our director of public works planning. Um, so if she can respond to that question. We don't have anything particular in mind, but from time to time there are uh, pedestrian uh, plans, downtown plans that come up, and it would be good to have funding available to match, most likely to match grants for uh, planning studies. That is another item that was in the capital budget, but we thought it would be more appropriate to include that in the operating budget since it can't be capitalized. me um, promote Jason to the meeting let's see hi Jason good evening everyone so yeah, I'm trying to find 427 my chart does not have the line of service contract
So that's that's the college um, gift to the town, which is in two parts. One uh, based on investments, and the other based on the tax rate. So, given that investments have performed well, that was where that was coming from. Correct. Can you have a little more? Um, is that a contract that um, will be ongoing? Is this what we'll be doing in the future? And what happens if not all the towns uh, agree to it? Or can you explain a little more about that? Uh, so this is the unfiltered request, the ambulance service uh, for a budgeted amount this year by contract. We. The select board is meeting with the ambulance service later in this meeting uh, to talk more about this that request. Um, so that that is what we know in, in its correspondence with us, which is in the packet. The Middlebury Re Regional EMS um, said that it needed this cre increase and also further increases um, in uh, future years in order to uh, make be uh, sustainable. Oh, so this is, so th this proposal is just for this coming year and it'll be different and on, on it just, I remember it was such a big jump when they went up to the $84,000 and, and it just, yeah. But I guess, I mean, there really isn't any other options, right? We don't know yet. <laughs> Victoria, we're gonna we're gonna discuss this here in a, um, pretty shortly uh, after eight o'clock. I guess there's someone to talk to. Yeah. This okay, is the first. This, this is the first year they've okay. ever done a contract, and and they're doing a contract I'm with sorry? us. This is the first year they've ever done a contract with us or anybody. So it's it's all new to us right now. Um, we're a little surprised at okay. the at the increase. Um, they have their justifications for it. It's, it's a it's a cost per um, per resident, and it's jumped up to thirteen dollars. Um, so if you want to hang around till after eight o'clock, you can hear what they have to say. I will. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I, and I just I appreciate the effort to um, keep on sure shorter and um, covering the, that extra impact with. Um, with our excess funds from the option tax. And um, I just, it, your efforts every year to minimize have been really great. And um, thank you, I, and a lot of it's out of our control. I hope someday health and insurance won't be part of our property taxes. I think that'd be a huge help if the legislature would do something about that. But uh, I think that's it, so thank you. Thanks, Victoria. Thank, thank you, Victoria. Fred. Fred. No sailing for Fred this winter. No sailing for Fred this winter. He's no not. Sailing in the winter? He's not heading down to Bermuda. Yeah. Sail here. <laughs> Salt water <laughs> still. Lake will be great. <laughs> hey, Fred. Hi. Hi, all. Can hey, you Fred. hear me? 
Yes. yes. So um, this budget is um, proposing the use of uh, surplus funds to stabilize the tax rate um, in the amount of $434,000. You can see that on line item. Right at uh, 121, we have a budgeted deficit uh, in, in, that is included already. Uh, we are still awaiting uh, the year-end uh, FY23 audit, but uh, the last time uh, it was, it, the surplus was about 1.5 million. So as you know, with, with inflation um, and other factors, uh, the equipment fund has been hard hit and there isn't any money uh, to tap for other things there. That we have assigned all of purchases for all of the, the, that um, funding. And, and we're still trying to address some deferred equipment um, you know, s schedule, you know, we deferred a lot of equipment purchases and we're still trying to tackle those. So I would not want to take anything out of the equipment fund. We may already have to postpone some purchases um, just because of inflationary pressures and what we had planned for to purchase and <coughs> what actual prices are. We may need to bump some things already. So. I would not be in favor of taking any money out of the equipment fund. Okay, thanks. You're doing the usual good job of uh, maintaining the stewardship of those, of those funds. And I, I just wanted to check in on that. Thank you very much. That's a good thanks. question. Thanks, Fred. Good question. Um, so I just added this to your packet this afternoon while we're talking about the uh, Cross Street Bridge Fund. And as a reminder, last year, you elected to transfer to $228,496 from the Cross Street Bridge Fund under Article 3, and that was to recognize the increased debt service on the police storage building and to offset the increase in uh, capital improvement planning funds. Part of the rationale for the capital improvement planning fund increase was that there was a $163,000 uh, included in the budget for library planning and we thought that that would be a one-time in increase. So rather than increase the tax rate, we took, we, we decided to use the um, Cross Street Bridge Fund for that. So just putting that on the table, the Cross Street Bridge Fund has uh, $1.3 million in it currently, net all of the transfers we've made in recent years So that's a potential source. And I, I laid out what the increase in the capital budget was this year and also what the um, debt service on the police storage building. Uh, as you may recall, for the police storage building, when we bonded for that, we bonded for the shortest possible term to save on interest. 
with the thought that it would use the Cross Street Bridge Fund to pay that debt service. What, what did you say the balance in the Cross Street Bridge Fund? 3.1 million. 3.1? Is that, oh, that's the total, but that doesn't subtract. Before we pull out from this. Right. Before we pull out. This, this, the 228,496 and the 290 that we use for the Maverick station and the $1 million for the storage tank has been deducted from that. Um, that is going to be removed? It is. So Already three, removed. 3.1. Yeah. So what's left to come out of the 3.1 million? Just what's in this budget, which is? Nothing yet. Nothing. No, nothing from this, just the local option tax. Um, so what we are planning to do for the local option tax. 1.3. So this is cross street bridge line items in number eight in your packet. So our revenue side of uh, the budget is 1.3 million in local option tax. $600,000 gift from the college for 1.9 in revenue, 1.9 million in revenue. The debt service totaling 859,300, leaving us, if the board elects, 1,040,700 to use to offset capital improvement expense. So wow. theoretically, if we don't take this million at the end of next year, we would have 4.1 in that fund. What is a reasonable amount to put aside for the actual cross street bridge? Um, do we have engineering estimates about the, what the maintenance? BHB did do a long-term maintenance plan yeah. for that. Um, eight years ago, so it was eight years ago. So maybe we should get that refreshed. Yeah, it, yeah. it wasn't. I'd like to make sure we're covering the primary purpose mm -hmm. that the voters elected to uh, tax themselves for before we divert too much money out of that funding. Mm -hmm. Well, with this, so we still have the three point one. Yes. So this is local option tax, less debt service. Yes. Which you do, which you have done. Last year you did 809,000, mm -hmm. um, which was all of the estimated um, excess um, net the debt service. However, we did have robust receipts. We in FY24 and are anticipating a, a surplus in that. And the 1.3 million is also hopefully a conservative number estimating for last year. And just for clarification, the difference between that 809, 308 and the 890, 692 is the expected versus the actual um, option tax receipts? No. The no. Eight eight ninety is debt service. Oh right, I'm not reading properly. Okay, there is a number greater than the eight oh nine, which we are expecting to be added to this fund. Perfect. Yeah. Good. I can add. I'm sure. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so we kind of got got into the details. I didn't know if anybody had had any. More questions, Fred? Are there any other hands up out there? Uh, anybody in our uh, viewing audience want to chime in? Well, if there are no further comments regarding the draft, 
FY25 general fund budget. Uh, I'm going to call the public hearing closed at what is it? 736. 7.36. Select board will finalize our FY25 budget at our January 23rd meeting. And we certainly thank uh, those of you who participated, uh, reviewed, and hold us accountable. Victoria and Fred uh, can <laughs> always count on you two for sure. And I love it. Thank you. Uh, our next item was kind of a continued review. We just went through that with Kathleen. Are there any questions on that, Kathleen? Anything else you want to show us in that review? I think it would be worthwhile for us to look at an updated cost. I don't think that their estimates for what needs to be done is going to differ, but the cost might have exploded. So one of the big items on the list was paving that the state did. Um, so and we don't have to do that. And we don't have to do that. Ooh, we should look at that. We might find that we are comfortable pulling a little bit more out of there. How much I think leaving it, especially given some of the projects that we're talking about it, I think if we're gonna try to have some sort of a level ramp, we don't wanna pull too much. Yeah, so one thing I'm, I'm cautious about is what's gonna happen with all of the uh, stormwater permitting and mm -hmm. what those projects are gonna cost and um, I, I just, I, w I wanna make sure, I, I wanna balance the property tax rate, but I also wanna make sure we have some funding to go, to make sure we have match funding to go after some additional grant money. Mm -hmm. You know, some, I'm hoping there's some money still available, but I feel like, you know, some of the ARPA, ARPA federal money is starting to dry up a little bit and we still have to do those projects and mm -hmm. um, they're gonna be costly, so. Um, so, I, I don't know. I, oh, I, I, yeah. I, I, I I'm totally not agree. We don't, we, I don't think we want to try to take every dollar we have and not keep some for matches. I mean, we've been, some of the reason why we've been so successful is we had cash in pocket and plans yep. we were, that were execution ready and we could, we could provide the match. Yep. So we could make a commitment to get the project done. And I, I think we have to retain that flexibility. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I just think we ought to look, we owe it to yeah, look at yeah. it. Yeah, oh, sure, I don't, I don't disagree. I'm just, I don't know what mm -hmm. the, an, I don't know what the answer is. I'm mm -hmm. just, yeah. you know. Uh. One of the, certainly that That is one way to get, uh, we, we certainly carry a lot of the responsibility of providing services for the greater community, greater Addison County community. That is a one payback we get is yes. that local option tax. Mm -hmm. Yes. Helps level the playing field Absolutely. a little bit. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, I'm, yeah, it definitely helps us create, it creates some revenue from us that comes from not just the middle grade taxpayers. Mm -hmm. right. so. Uh, Heidi Lacey from the Charter House is with us. To talk a little about their budget request and hey. ongoing efforts of the Charter House. Hello, good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, very well. I think it's Wheel of Fortune <laughs> now, Heidi. It does make you real, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so, um, first of all, thank you for this. Um, Crystal actually notified me yesterday. Uh, so, I was so happy that she uh, sent me that reminder. And I'm, I'm pleased to speak with you all tonight. Sorry, I'm not here in person. Um, I believe the purpose of my discussion with you is 
just to share what we're doing at Charter House, uh, you probably recognize we have not asked for an increase um, in the three years that I've been there. Um, I'm trying to do that very um, programmatically. I just feel that the state can assist um, with the finances more so than our, our local folks should be. So I am utilizing state funding um, in, in more efficient ways. Um, but even though we haven't asked for an increase, we certainly increase the services. Um, we are still operating as an emergency shelter, a low barrier emergency shelter, um, which is we are now one of three low barrier shelters in the state, um, which really just means that our eligibility requirements are less than what um, a high barrier shelter may be. And we do allow things such as substance use, um, incarceration history, numerous um, barriers that, that would not allow someone into a mm. high barrier shelter. Um, we are open all day, every day. Um, that is different. Um, prior to COVID, we were a roaming shelter um, and we decided um, very deliberately to um, allow those folks that are housed with us to stay on a property all day long. Um, and believe me, this was probably one of my biggest challenges because just as you all are dealing with staffing shortages, so are we in human services. And um, that's no easy feat to, uh, to keep uh, folks with us all day, every day. Um, I feel that the services that I would like to highlight um, the most for you all are just an increase in housing case management. Um, Charter House has taken on a much larger role um, within that process. Um, last year, we were able to house 30 individuals, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, most were here in Addison County, so that felt very good. Um, and we continue to work on the partnerships with Donna Graham um, and other housing navigators as well. Um, but we're meeting with people once they are housed, so we're trying to um, offer them what's called housing retention. So we're not just an emergency shelter anymore. Um, the partnerships in which we are uh, really growing include the Rary Police Department. Um, we work, I feel, very closely and very well with the Rary Police Group. Um, we work also very closely with the Turning Points of Addison County, um, as well as CSAC. We've brought both of those agencies into Charter House regularly for skill building, um, for coaching, for um, therapies. Uh, so those partnerships are, are vital to what we're doing and we continue to grow them. Um, we work in the town partners as well. Um, we work regularly with Tri Valley um, as well as Oakley Library staff um, just regarding the unhoused. And those conversations seem to result in good um, solutions most of the time. Um, and also we're doing quite a bit um, as you know, in terms of the Homelessness Task Force, um, we are helping um, the Middlebury Police Department in Cassidy to facilitate that group. Uh, we are also one of the only agencies right now that are actively going out every single week, um, although Turning Points and CSAC have been with us since October um, consistently, but um, we were doing that work even prior to October and will continue to do so. Um, from a, a more broad perspective, um, I know we are housing, uh, I'm sorry, we are uh, with various housing committees throughout the state and really working with Housing and Homeless Alliance of Vermont on this year's legislative session with involving general assistance um, review and um, affordable housing. We chair the um, Addison County Housing Coalition uh, group and, um, and I do sit on the board of Housing and, and Homeless um, Alliance of Vermont. So we're trying to also advocate at a state level um, to help to continue to bring in more funding for Addison County as a whole. Um, oftentimes Middlebury feels like we're hit the hardest. Um, you know, and you probably wonder, are you footing the bill for uh, all of the other 22 or so uh, towns? And, and I will say we are serving um, almost every town uh, and some only with one or two households, but it does feel like we are seeing that increase. Um, and we are also asking them for um, funding as well. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, or not. 
Any questions of Heidi? Well, I appreciate the update. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks, Heidi. Uh, we appreciate your involvement and support for some of the critical issues in the town too. And, and uh, no, it's not easy. We've been um, getting some information from state uh, as they as they brainstorm how to handle and and cope with the increasing homelessness uh, and and some of the other issues that we're facing and so uh, I know you've been our one of our key point people in in the task force and I think that's critical to some of our successes we've seen so thank you one other thing I'll one other thing Brian I'd like to add um, we are working with the Addison Independent to create a public education series and I believe that John is going to start running that next week. Um, but that's at least five to six articles that really do address housing and homelessness. Um, we had decided as a task force that really public education was necessary um, to keep these conversations at the table. So that was one effort that um, we have kicked off and uh, I look forward to the public's um, response to those. So I'll certainly be available for all of you sounds good and, and is part of that education also as to what resources are out there and, and how to contact them because yes we are trying to identify resources we're also trying to uh, address a little bit of what's going on out of county that we are being affected by um, so that when we hopefully um, as spring rolls around we can be better prepared um, as a nonprofit agency and, and town officials to to answer the end, the potential end of motels. Mm. Um, so the the series is there's a there's a wide variety of topics, but one will be resources, um, and others will be really identifying barriers and, and what solutions are available today versus two years down the road when that doesn't help. It's timely to get that in while the uh, legislature's in session too. Yeah. <laughs> Is, uh, the 18th of this month, so you'll see us all out Monday morning commute. We'll be waving again this year. Okay, all right. Thanks. Thank you all for your Thanks, support. Heidi. It means a lot to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. So now uh, we have the library. If I'm reading my schedule, my revised schedule right. 11 is 9. <laughs> Hey Dana. Hey Where Chris. Are you from Lincoln. <laughs> is it windy up there? It really is. It feels like the end of the world up here, but I'm hoping oh, it's all ambient wow. noise. None of it's going to come through on the, the computer mic, so hopefully you're not getting too much. Good evening. Hey Buster. Hey Chris. Hey, Chris. Not um, the end of the world in Walton. <laughs>
are in the process of actually doing our final detailed estimate in the coming weeks. So we're producing outline specifications, which are going to give our, our entire team, our estimating team, that next level of detail to really give us the confidence as we head towards the coming months to that May bond vote that we'll have even yet more detail coming towards the end of this month. So just wanted to provide you all with that context. As Dana said, we prepared what is already, I would, I would characterize as a detailed estimate. There's about 10 pages of actual detail that comprises this one page summary that we've provided to all of you. Um, you know, in order to keep this conversation in the context of that total budget, which as Dana said, mentioned, we're at about 16.5 million for the total project budget. And one thing that we um, wanted to make very clear is that we fully anticipate with a geothermal heating and cooling system to be able to capitalize upon $540,000 of project savings from the federal government, which would bring the total project cost down to right about $16 million. So we're, we're very excited to be able to be in a position to present what we think is a real um, benefit, not only from a first um, instance, but also in the long-term energy and operating costs of, of the, of the uh, library. So with that, um, I suppose, why don't I just open it up to any questions um, that folks have relative to that one page total project uh, budget summary. Well, Chris, a quick one that comes to mind is um, other large geothermal uh, heating projects that you've done. Yeah, actually, we have several um, in place. One of the largest that we just installed is the Young Rogers project. It's, it's right in South Burlington. It's a, a new um, uh, tech set center. They build, they build rubber computers. It's about a $15 million project in a leverage uh, this same um, inflation reduction act uh, money to offset the upfront cost for the geothermal. Now in the past, we found that geothermal was, was really um, outside of the initial cost. And because of the Inflation Reduction Act, it's actually bringing this cost down to the point where it's essentially a zero, um, zero time payback uh, for the system. So we're very, very excited to be able to uh, leverage that. We have an initial study on the geology of the site, which indicates that, and we've got a, a final report coming in the next couple of weeks, which indicates that we think that an open loop um, geothermal system is going to be well suited for the site. Um, also, um, our team, we went to architect the geothermal um, um, system for the South Burlington Library, and it's a pretty, you know, city hall project that was uh, recently completed. We, we have also a number of others that are in construction currently. And the performance from OnLogic has been what you'd expect? So the project is just being occupied right now. Gotcha. So it's really going to really be the next year. But the performance is, is, is actually fairly easy to calculate. It's really, is the auto production weld the capacity that you anticipate. And that, that really we won't know here on the site until we do an actual test well, um, which in, in this case would be would be occurring after uh, after a positive bond vote. Gotcha. Okay. Chris, how, do, how does that Inflation Reduction Act work? They write us a check back? Essentially, Brian, yes. And, and frankly, it can be, it can be a little bit confusing, um, and the way in which we have accounted for it in this total project budget is essentially to say that we'll have to have the funds in place for a $16.5 million project. Mm -hmm. And then after the project is completed, 
and the improper information is submitted to the federal government, the town would receive that payment in what we're estimating right now, conservatively, by the way, is a 30% that equates to $540,000. Now, if we use um, all American made systems and parts and pieces, we get another 10%, which is then successful on several of our projects. So we're estimating it at 30% right now, Brian, that's the 540,000. Hopefully we can get to um, 40% savings. I was just curious because uh, I'm used to the tax credit side and where we don't pay taxes, uh, <laughs> I didn't know how we were gonna get our money. And, and is there, uh, is there a window when when it has to be reappropriated, uh, or how long does that is that good for? No, once well, Brian, once the uh, in your case as a as a town or community, once the project is completed and we submit the required you know backed up materials to demonstrate you know um, the exact cost of the system, that money comes back um, from the federal government to the town. Okay, I'm just, I'm used to like on the private citizen side, on the tax rebates, it has, it gets, uh, you know, it basically goes year to year. And if we, and we're not, definitely not going to have the project done next year. So we're, we're, we're yeah. sure we'll be good into 25 with that plan. Yeah, and, and in fact, Brian, no, right, it would, it would probably be 2026 by the time that, you know, I'm not worried about yeah. seeing the funds if you tell me. I'm talking that where yeah, it's a guarantee you. that that if we do our paperwork right, we'll get those funds. I Co correct. And Brian, we will verify. We will certainly be verifying that before the systems are finally designed and formed. Okay, because like uh, you know, solar installation it has to be functioning by the 31st of December, or right. you're subject right. to the following year's tax rules, which could be different. So, exactly. exactly. Okay. Yep. Here's a question from Fred. Fred, I think you're unmuted. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, I have two questions. One week, I see in the mass timber, is there a reduction and then an addition? Yeah. I'm curious what that's about. And my second question is, what are you going to do to the lower parking lot to expand the alignment for 212,000? Sure, sure. I'll jump right into that. Um, so, uh, Fred, as you and, and the select board um, are aware from past projects, one way to manage a budget such as this is to have a series of what we call alternates. So those could either be additive or deductive alternates. We listed about 12 alternates um, to date. Some will add costs if we elect to choose them. Some will remove costs from the project. Now, this again is, is one way that we as a team managed to let the select board and ultimately the, the, the voters um, of Middlebury will support you know, an X number of total bonds. So it's one of our tools to, to manage through that money. So in our current estimate, we have included a portion of the overall building as mass timber. Mass timber is, as, as many of you know, it's a way to sequester carbon in our modern you know, building toolkit, if you will. So some of the building, as it's considered currently in the estimate, some of it's mass timber and some of it is conventional steel framing and concrete slab, okay? So if, uh, Fred, if we were to deduct the mass timber from the project and go strictly with concrete and steel, that would reduce the project cost by about $222,000, okay? And then um, just if we also look with any entirely mass timber frame, that would add another $300,000. $386,000. Now, to address your other question, oh, is it after the 246? 
Yes, to do a full mass timber and a full building, the whole addition. So mass timber overall, for all the carbon benefits of the less timber, is a half million over bucks? Correct. Yep. And, and, and Fred, one thing that I will say is when we're just completing a mass timber project right now, three stories is, is counted, but in New Hampshire it's about a $22 million project. The cost of mass timber is coming down because you know more materials are being sourced and it's you know more available. And this is our snapshot. <clears throat> excuse me. At this point in time, we'll be studying it. You know, again, as we move after a after a bond vote, so we have a positive bond vote to you know identify other sourcing opportunities to bring that cost down. Thank you. So yes. much parking lot. Yeah, so on the on the parking lot, this this two hundred thousand two hundred twelve thousand dollars number actually contemplates realignment, restriping, um, a whole new top source of paving over the entire lot. It's it we believe it exceeds what is uh, you know ultimately required for gaining additional parking space. So that's that's really the goal here is we retain within one space the upper parking lot. Now we're looking to maximize the lower level lot as best we can. Uh, we, we firmly believe that there's, there's going to be a way to do this for less than $200,000. This again is like we shrink. Sorry. Like we shrink and it's, it could be less, or at least we could retain walls in there. Absolutely. We're still early, Fred, in the, in the engineering. So we're working with architect engineering. Um, you know, along along with our, our architect who's going to win the race here. Um, so this is the snapshot at this moment in time. We are going to be meeting um, informally uh, with Jim Murray, as well as um, Fire Chief Shaw, just to you know, again, here's what we're thinking early in the process and so on. Are there any you know any issues that uh, we believe are need to be addressed, etc. Thanks, Chris. Questions? Chris and I have another question. Uh, the construction cost estimate uh, is that that's a point in time of present, and then the escalation to fall 2024 is the projected future cost at our earliest expected start date. Is that what we have here? Realistic expected start date. So we would be in the into it winter of 25, or no, right. uh, yeah, winter 25. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so Brian, um, we, we anticipate or are we estimating right now that it's about 56 weeks of construction, so roughly 13 months overall duration. Starting, you know, breaking ground in the fall, yeah. we fully acknowledge is aggressive. That's a that's a very aggressive schedule with a with a May bond vote. We have to, you know, finish drawing construction documents so we can get out to bid to all the local and regional subcontractors. So right now, the market is indicating to us, and we're keeping very very close um, tabs on this nationally through a number of different sources. We're looking at a four and a half percent escalation from today to that time, you know, as we say, fall of 2024. Now, one, there's several things that we're going to be looking at, scouting very, very carefully, and we've talked about this with the project team, is that very often we find minimizing winter conditions and getting full subcontract involvement in a spring bid, so the spring of 2025, could help offset you know, some costs. Now, it's a balancing act because the market has been unlike anything that any of us have seen. So crystal ball still says that there is going to continue to be escalation, right, beyond the fall. Now, we, we're, we're always balancing those, those other benefits. So like I said, winter conditions and so on. Yeah, 
I'm with you. I'm just trying to follow your your reasoning here. And then, um, when does our ARPA funding have to be used by? It has to be committed by the end of this year and spent by uh, December 31st, 2026. 26? Okay, yeah. I think, I mean, that's one of the things that's driving some of the guys that you'll be using on this type of a project is all of the ARPA funds. So. And, and just a question on the mass timber. Is this a is this a design element that it, it adds to the appearance, or what, what? Why did we get into the mass timber discussion? Sure, no, it's just a great question, Brian. And it is a new technology um, that we're basically seeing. The, the, the concept is you're using um, wood materials that really can't be used otherwise because you're basically glue laminating smaller pieces of wood to create big timbers to build from. Almost like building an old mill building with, with large timbers, but this is with um, smaller laminated pieces. The true benefit, though, is in its carbon sequestration um, on properties. So essentially, we're, we're out of the ground with a building that, that you know, the whole structural frame and steel and concrete are, are really high in carbon. So it's, it's a real benefit from a sustainability perspective. The other benefit is it's, it's actually really beautiful as a finished product on the interior of the, of the new addition of the library. So you're sort of looking at the historic library as one context with the old oak that's sort of stained dark. And this is a natural, you know, a very lighter material that is the actual structural frame. Um, so it's something, Brian, that frankly, um, we can make a decision, and it doesn't even have to be now, to frankly be asked the bond vote to, to go with mass timber or not. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like, like many other aspects of the um, overall composition of the project, exterior materials, finishes, and so on, much of that really will be determined in its final form after Just trying to educate okay. myself. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. And if I could just uh, remind the board that I believe that our contract with Leark and Lingland here was to get our schematic design up to a certain point, which was about 65, you know, sort of two thirds of the way along. It wasn't complete schematic design. It was to get us to the point where we have a good enough feel for the cost of the project to proceed with the bond vote. So all this to say that once the bond vote happens, we can't just turn around and start building. There's, there's more work to be done at that point. Yeah. I suppose if you have any questions as a follow-up afterwards, that we can uh, collect them and, and get them through to uh, Dana and Joe and, and they can get us uh, feedback. I'll t can I just ask one question? Yeah, one of course. Um, so this, this estimate does not include any relocation costs during that 56 weeks of construction and renting and storage and all that. We still, we're still not including that in this number, correct? Fees in that number. 
So, so this price does include some some, yeah. some money. Mm -hmm. Unknown what that cost would be. Okay. Mm -hmm. We need to right. develop that some more. Okay. Okay. And, and this uh, this is probably more of a question for Joe. This is with every Joe and Dana. That this was with everything that you were hoping for as far as flow and layout program programmatically at this point with this particular budget. Yes, this is accomplishes our program. Yeah. We can fit everything that we wanted in here and the layout is fantastic. It is a high functioning, wonderful library that will bring a lot of improvement to this. And uh, I would say that at one point we did consider another option to bring costs down that would have eliminated one of the entrances for the rear entrance that would bring people into the community a meeting room in the evening and it would bring the square footage down it would save us some space we just really didn't like the way that that the flow uh, worked with um for uh for people so i would say that we're we're quite happy with this at this at this uh, point it, it seems really functional it seems like it'll really serve the needs of the community and if we're thinking ahead to the future of the town, which I think is, is what we want to be doing, um, I think this would set us up very nicely for the future. Okay. Lindsay, did you have any questions? No, um, not specifically. I'm Well then, uh, uh, Dana, Chris, Joe, we thank you for joining us uh, this evening and appreciate the presentation. All right, thanks everyone. If you have follow-up thoughts or questions, just send them along. Thank you. Good, good to see everyone. Take Cheers. Care. Is 11? Is 9? Is what? 10? 9? Oh, 9 is 10. Okay. Come on forward. We, we just got to your place as you're walking in the door. So Perfect yeah. timing. That's really um, unusual. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, this is all by, by design around here. Come Can on. Choreographed? Come on. <laughs> you know, thanks for moving it around. The sure class we're taking is pretty important, so thank you. So Kate, we're, uh, we're here to hear from you guys uh, as far as uh, uh, your budget request and, and the move to contractual services that you would like to do and, and uh, anything else that you would like to present to us. I'm sure we're going to have some questions afterwards, but uh, we'll turn the, turn the mic over to you. So I'm sure I'll start with, you know, we put out the contract to maybe move um, the way the ask was to make it equitable between all of the towns, um, simplify it, um, and get us more on um, par with the services we're providing um, for the way we're asking it. Um, that simplified piece might not have happened how we were hoping. Yeah, um, so, so we may be rolling out a little bit more of a simplified ask. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we still have towns where um, if we're asking for an appropriation increase, they're asking us to go collect signatures and petition and then get on the ballot as, you know, a separate line item and what we are we're hoping to correct was the perception that we're like many of the other nonprofits that are coming and asking for a donation from the towns every year it's simply not 
the case. It is it is a fee for service, um, and I think we'll be able to explain that a bit better through the course of this presentation we put together. But the reimbursement rates are such that we lose money on calls, and it's not just us; it's every EMS organization. Uh, and you, I'm sure, are reading about it in the news. Um, if you're not, check out Vermont Digger. Um, <clears throat> it's something that's being dealt with at a state level, and um, there are attempts to work at it at a federal level, uh, but that takes time. And until then, we need to supplement the revenue stream with appropriations from the towns. But it's, 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 not, an, it's not an ask for a donation. It is truly a fee for a necessary service. And that's what we're hoping to convey. You know, much like, much like the towns will engage with maybe DNF to have their paving services done, or an IT company to handle their IT services. We're your emergency service company. Um, and yes, you could look at other options, but this is what we're putting out. So I know, um, and I'm not sure necessarily here, but for the couple of select boards we've already talked to, and um, two of them that had lawyers on them had some concerns with some of the language that was in the contract. Um, so what we thought would be a simplified way to maybe change um, how the ask was done. Um, I don't want to say it backfired, but we're, we're trying to back it up to make it even more simplified. Um, one of the towns said that they were unable to bind a general fund past the term that they were on. So um, basically we're gonna move back to it, <laughs> right? But we didn't think so. So it'll be, you know, we're looking to do a yearly ask um, at a date that works for every select board with a payment date that works for every town. Some are on a yearly budget, some are on a fiscal. Is your budgeting done on the town fiscal calendar or on the calendar? We're, we're a fiscal. We're yeah. a fiscal. Yeah. But not every, not most are, but not every town yeah. has to be. Sure. Right. So, you know, our, our initial thought would be, you know, something like we've done before by um, October 1st, um, we'll put out our request with some numbers and <coughs> the little excerpt that can go into the town report for the number of calls we've done and, you know, any any highlights from our um, business for the year. Your, your FY is July 1. Yeah. So we prepared a presentation this evening and we felt it was important to kind of outline a little bit of who we are as an agency, where we've come from and what we do, but also really be transparent and kind of talk about some of our numbers so that you can understand the request for additional funding. Um, I believe Kate and Ben have met all of you. My name's Walker. I'm relatively new to the admin team at Middlebury, but just so you know who you're talking to. So if we kind of get into it, Kate or Ben could speak to the history. It certainly is. Oh, I the ambulance. Right? <laughs> right. Classic. Um, but yeah, a great group of volunteers that founded um, Middlebury Volunteer Ambulance Association in 1970. I just was actually doing the last bit of cleaning out underneath the stairs and found some old, old run reports that um, Pete all came to have a look through to see if there were any names we've missed because usually we try to connect all of those founding members. <laughs> so he stopped in yesterday. Um, so so we're, yeah. we're no longer really a volunteer organization, right? We have We have evolved like most EMS to the point where we are mostly staffed by career personnel yeah. right? and that is our biggest success yeah. and we'll speak to those numbers later on slide please so kind of outlining our mission as you guys can read there right the overall purpose although we are operating as a business and asking for funding to help support us is really to provide the highest level of care possible to our community and that takes a couple of different forms. It's not only 911 calls, another large portion of what we do, and it also is a way that we've diversified to try to help compensate for the high cost and low reimbursement is doing some transfers. Typically those are from Porter Hospital going up to UVM, which is a definitive level of care. So it's kind of 
contrary to what you'd believe of like that every hospital is made the same, smaller hospitals do have some limitations. So some things are truly emergent and we can take those up to UVM. Um, and, and that's guaranteed revenue for us, right? That's money we know we're gonna get. That's why it's an important piece of the business model. Not every ambulance service does that. Yeah, so we're really prioritizing providing the best care we can and we're trying to do our best to make it financially feasible for everyone involved. Um, we also are one of only two ambulance services left in the state that provide vehicle extrication services. That would be us and Mad River Ambulance just over the mountain. So kind of a unique thing we do. Ultimately, it does provide a cost saving to all the towns that we do extrication for. So instead of, I think our new set of tools was over $50,000 for like the new high tech stuff. Instead of every town needing to spend 50 grand on that, one agency is doing it and then everyone can reap the benefits of centralized training and stuff. So it is really trying to do what's best for the region. And we lose money on those. There's no billing for the heavy lifts, right? We do. No. Good for you. Yeah. Um, sure. So out of the um, three ambulance services we have in Addison County, we're the only paramedic level uh, ambulance service. Um, and, and again, in a future slide, um, it'll show a little bit of difference what paramedics can do. Um, but it is a college degree, it takes two years um, and, and a lot of time. We are very, very fortunate to have one paramedic volunteer with us um, who we um, appreciate all the time he does give us. Um, we have two ambulances that run regularly. One's on 24 seven, that one's staffed with a paramedic. And then we have a second truck that runs from um, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, we also have a model, all of our phones have this app called Active 911. So if there's um, need for additional resources, a motor vehicle accident, um, an MCI of any kind, or just another uh, transfer, we put out on this Active 911 to see if we can get additional staff to come in. Um, and that's not uncommon that we have all four trucks on the road for one reason or another. Um, we also have um, a trailer which we've used uh, for multi-purposes and a huge forklift. Sure. Do you want questions as you go through or? Yeah, absolutely. What's the health of your vehicular fleet nowadays? I know a lot of our money initially was to upgrade your, the ambulance. Uh, it is. And, and what's, what's the mileage on your on your ambulances now and what kind of? Well, I mean, the good news, diesels uh, tend to take the mileage, um, but we are over 300,000 on the third and fourth out trucks. Um, one is scheduled for replacement. We did order that last year. Um, we had expect to take possession of it this year, um, but they're now telling us it may be 25 before we see it. A lot of it's just kind of <coughs> stretching the life to do our best to keep as many ambulances available as possible. And the cost of ambulances continues to increase even from when we ordered that to this year, there's already been a huge price hike. When you ordered that, did they lock the price? They did. Mm -hmm. They did and it, it was such an increase from one to the other. We hesitated locking it in um, because we had hoped it would go down. Um, so they did, they <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> we, yeah, but they actually put in writing that should, you know, the cabin chassis come in at a lower rate, they would pass the savings on to us. But Wow, one the, way of luck. That's yeah, nice. Um, <laughs> but it went from 191000 to 249000 um, So, I mean, all served. Yeah. yeah. Um, the only difference between those two trucks was uh, one was a 350 and the next one was a 450. The F-350s were struggling a little bit to carry the load. Um, yeah. So it's been recommended to go to the 2450s. But um, we have a 2015, 17, 21. One, yeah. Two of them are pretty close together. And this, yeah. 22, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So if we kind of look at the state of Vermont, we thought it was important to talk about the health of EMS in the state. If you guys have been reading the news, which I imagine you do, you'll see a lot of different things regarding EMS and its funding. So Middlebury Ambulance, we are one of 78 services in the state. 
it's worth noting that in 2023, three ambulance services closed and their service areas were passed along to other agencies nearby. Um, not trying to be alarmist, but just showing that there really are a lot of places out there struggling and we're trying our best to stay as viable as possible. So those, those agencies uh, disappearing, was it a planned merger or they just couldn't maintain operations? A lot of them. A so lot of them. I, <laughs> Sorry. I, I had I had put out um, a survey myself, and then Vermont Ambulance Association followed on the heels, trying to get what everybody's per capita was, what their service area consisted of, um, what models they were using. Like we were all in this together, and one of them answered the question of what their town appropriation was with woefully too low, uh -huh. and their plan was to try and figure out what it would take to keep running. And three months later, they closed their doors. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And so that that particular ambulance service is, area that is not a planned merger. Up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I know I know the same happened with Mount Holly. Um, like they they couldn't reach an agreement with the town on on funding levels, and yeah. then Ludlow picked it up. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's in front of us. Oh. Right now, is there ambulance service statewide? Like, you no, you will get an ambulance anywhere. There are deserts. There are. there are deserts. So the response times in those regions are extremely long. Um, we didn't include that map, but there was a very. It is on here. It is in mm -hmm. the next slide. Third. 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 No, it's not. That's that not one. the desert map. Oh, yeah, it's coming. The that's Northeast fine. Anyway, we can provide uh, an interesting one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but kind of breaking down the billing, which we think is an important part, because if you look at some of the pie charts we saw that had been prepared and stuff. It's interesting what our overall billing is versus what our actual revenue is. And to break down how our billing works, it's important to see what our main payers are. Um, so Medicare and Medicaid make up 77% of our payer, um, mix. payer mix. And what's pertinent about that is if you look kind of at the breakdown of the levels, you have BLS emergent, ALS emergent, and then the ALS level two. So those are the different rates that can be billed at. So no matter how much money that call cost us or however much equipment, expertise, experience we use, diesel, whatever it is, they will only pay us those fixed amounts plus the mileage. So it doesn't matter how much equipment we go through. On our next slide, we're gonna kind of talk about that. Um, and you wanna speak to the copay, how that plays in? Uh, yeah, so if, um, and our next slide will show, um, it's like a, a genuine cost breakdown of a cardiac arrest. Um, at an ALS2 rate, and, but depending on which insurance, at the, at the highest, one of the Medicare Part C's is a $250 copay, but from that $250, whatever the copay is, that's deducted from us and then charged to the, the insured, right. um, and we, that is a lot of what we see not paid. Mm -hmm. um, so. It's a very small 200 but if that's adding up over a couple thousand calls a year, it really does make a big difference in our budget. But if you're a household struggling to buy food or medication or heating fuel, and then you get an ambulance bill for services that you've already received, that's the last thing you're gonna pay. Sure. Right. We do not aggressively send our accounts receivable to collections. We in-house collect, we send letters, we make some phone calls. Well, um, but at the end of the day, we're not taking someone to court so they don't have heat, you know, that's not, what an organization that's meant to help people. That's not how we feel we should pursue getting other funds. So if we go to the next slide, oh, we have one more on payer mm, breakdown. And then I think it's one more below. So this is just a different way of showing it, just in a pie chart. Um, same stat, the 77%, but you can kind of see our breakdown. And it's surprising, Vermont only has about a 3% uninsured rate, which is pretty impressive compared to the national averages. Is 7 which is around 7%. But what's interesting is despite having such a high population with insurance, we still have these funding deficits with our reimbursement. Because they might have insurance, but they're underinsured. Underinsured, very high copay, stuff like that, and they can't afford that copay. So all we're getting is that small fixed rate or whatever the insurance is willing to give us. And as the insurance costs rise, people will take a higher deductible so that their premiums aren't as high. Sure. And then they struggle to meet the right. payment for their high deductible. So the next page, just at a high level, the, the green line is you know our costs, what we're charging. 
and the red line reflects the reimbursement rate. So the gap that we need to close to maintain you know, successful operations is that gap between the red and green line. And so you'll notice there's that huge kind of nosedive in the last three months. That's due to the billing and payment cycle typically takes 30 to 90 days. So if you can kind of look October back into the year, you'll see a more accurate of kind of what that trend is. Um, and you think about any business, like no store could stay open if they only were received 55% of what they were supposed to be receiving for any service or good. So that's the gap. And so we, well, let's get into the cost on this call. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right, so Millbury Ambulance respond 123 Street Lane for a male patient who is unresponsive, not breathing, unknown if CPR is in progress, right? So that could happen at any time and our crews are gonna be ready to respond. So what we chose to do was do a cost breakdown of all the disposable goods. If you scroll down just a teeny bit, <coughs> thank you, you'll kind of see the first aisle is disposable goods. So those are all life-saving pieces of equipment with relatively high expenses that are gonna be thrown out at the end of that call. We're happy to get into the, the details and I'm a real geek when it comes to medicine, but really all it is is there's a ton of things that help save a life and they're all very expensive. And our, so that comes out to $380 for this mock cardiac arrest scenario. Next, we have our medications, which we push the medications and then they hopefully had the effect we wanted. But again, those are not gonna ever be reused in, in any way. So there's $133 gone. We look at our staffing per AHA guidelines, right? The American Heart Association. A minimum of six providers is preferred for a cardiac arrest. And often it takes more providers than that. So with our two staffed ambulances, right, if one's not available, whatever that may be, we're gonna be having other people respond from home typically. Um, and then a cardiac arrest, let's say in the town of Middlebury, I, luckily we're not driving too far, but that call from time of tones to the time our truck is cleaned up and back in service is typically two to three hours. And then subsequently, if we are fortunate and able to restart that patient, they have a pulse, we call that ROSC, they're gonna go to Porter, and then we're gonna be taking one of our paramedic trucks to bring that patient up to UVM, in many cases, to continue getting the care that they need. So, that's all of our kind of soft good costs, right? The disposable goods, the medication, and our staffing rate. And if and I could just interject. Absolutely. The, that is very realistic. That isn't like a what we might use. That is, that is very indicative of what we would use on yeah. a cardiac arrest. Absolutely, yeah, so, and that is one of our more equipment intensive calls, but we thought that was a good example because when you think an ambulance, that's kind of what you think of. It's a great example. And then when we look at the equipment, right, we have almost $67,000 worth of just equipment that we use on that call to help potentially save that life. And then all that equipment, all the supplies and providers are gonna be loaded in to $305,000 worth of transport. So the ambulance, the stretcher, the power load system. And then when we look at it, we're looking at around $1,000 in just those soft good costs, not counting any of the equipment, ambulance upkeep, the pay for the staff when they're not responding to this call, building upkeep and such. Um, you guys can continue to break it down probably better than I could. Do you want me to say anything? Yeah, more? please. So, so uh, w with those costs, um, if you go back and look at what our 77% of the time, Medicaid, Medicare, would call this um, an ALS2 call. So we'd get seven hundred and fifty dollars for the call. Less um, the two less, fifty copay. Less a twenty percent copay. So guaranteed pay of half of what just the soft goods cost for that call. So I, we just wanted to explain that there there is very much a gap between our insurance reimbursements and the cost. Now, there are some BLS calls that we don't use near that much. Sometimes we're just using the monitor for vitals, and yeah. it doesn't take those disposable goods, but we just wanted to give an example here. So, and to, you know, to help close that gap, <coughs> we, we aren't putting all of it on the municipalities, right? Um, we have a communication center, which is a revenue generator for us, right? Um, and um, so we tone out for different departments, uh, we do some call service, our hope is to land more contracts for dispatch, uh, which would offset the need to continue coming back, asking for more increases every year. Who do you uh, dispatch for? So um, right now we 
we're dispatching for um, a handful of fire. I mean, I can name the fire departments if you want, but okay. Salisbury Fire, Weybridge Fire, Shoreham Fire and First Response, Orwell Fire and First Response. Um, we dispatch ourselves, which is a huge cost savings. Sure. Um, unfortunately, um, we did just lose Missisquoi. Um, we were dispatching them through an IT link, huh. um, but they went with St. Albans. Um, yeah. uh, when they called us, they were very upset. It said it wasn't anything to do <laughs> it's with not their you, service. It's not <laughs> um, right. But they were, you know, it, police, fire, rescue, all, all in one building for them now. So Yeah, um, that's great. So we have the dispatch center. We have active fundraising campaigns. We're also um, answering service for some doctor's offices. Um, so we do after hours for um, Mapleview Oral Surgery, Rainbow Pediatric, all of the non-porter doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. um, huh. Mountain Health, Middlebury Family Health. Wow. Um, ASAC answering service. Um, so we do, we do a little bit of um, calls for that. I didn't know any of that. Trying to diversify as much as we can. Sure. But it's limited to some degree. Yeah. The next slide kind of addresses the, the, the current challenges, right? So, you know, we've, we've established that there's insufficient reimbursements, right? Um, there was a study or a report recently done. What was the organization that submitted that case? Um, so BEMSAC, Vermont EMS um, Agency. Um, advisory committee. I advisory guess. committee, yeah. yes. Um, so they've prepared a report um, that they've been um, getting. I went through a draft version, but it's what they're presenting to the legislator, um, the legislative body talking about EMS and, and the trials and tribute. Tribulations. Tribulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. <laughs> um, but uh, I could actually, when that's finalized, I can send a report. Yeah. Some, some of the highlights reading. from that are interesting and illuminating. Um, they note that over the past five years, uh, Vermont EMS providers have seen this 20% increase in call volume, and we are an integral part of the healthcare system. Um, as previously alluded to, you know, most services are performed by career professionals, um, and there has been a dramatic turnover rate among EMS staffing and personnel, and the primary driver is the compensation, right, or looking to get into another career field that's going to compensate them better, right? Um, so <laughs> it's also interesting to note that that over those same five years where the call volume increased 20%, the number of licensed EMS providers only increased 1%, right? So we've got a very small pool of qualified personnel that we are all chasing. And regrettably, uh, we are finding ourselves in a little bit of a, a, a salary race with other neighboring departments where we're all raising our, our wages and our payrolls and compensation packages to, to try and retain and attract the people that we need. Um, but that's why we're coming to the towns and asking for increases in the appropriations. We asked for $3 this year. Truthfully, we feel we need to be at $19 per cap, but we weren't gonna do it all at once and ask the town for a $9 so our intention is to do three dollars a year over each over the next three years. But who knows what may change in the interim, right? We may land a huge contract with dispatch um, or something may change at the state or federal level where we don't need to ask for quite as much. If your costs are $19 per capita, what are you doing while you're at 10, 13, and $16? Are you running deficits no no but we <laughs> well, I said, um, we we aren't on on par with other agencies as far as pay scales I see um, so that's part of retention yeah, trouble. Yeah, and I think is that and then on depending on how you break down some of the numbers there can be a deficit with the replacement fund of depending on what the forty thousand dollar monitor sure. the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar ambulance those replacements aren't always fully covered in the budget mm -hmm. Perfect. so we're really relying on outside donations for some of those. So it would make us more 
independent in that sense, but would really allow us to increase our benefits package. A lot of these big municipalities um, pay pensions, crazy numbers of sick days, vacation days, stuff that we just can't compete with currently. Sure. But what we have been able to do, though, is provide a, a great work environment. Um, and so we do have some loyalty to the staff we have. Mm -hmm. But um, when somebody, um, and, and again, this is, you know, this isn't, you know, to startle or, um, but one of our, it's close enough, we're the White River Valley Ambulance, you know, across the mountain. You know, their, their per capita is 72. They can pay better than us. And that's not that far of a drive. It is not that far. So we're not. So their base pay scale yeah. for their staff is a little bit better than ours. Um, I, you know, there's been a couple of other neighboring um, agencies that have said, like, we need to, we need to increase our pay scale, and we need to follow suit because we can't meet the rehab. Um, we're running an EMT class right now, so we're hoping to <laughs> gain interest. Um, Develop the local talent. Um, Two other quick questions. Um, have you seen a reduction in turnover in the last year or half year? It feels like maybe the COVID-inspired um, work rotation is, is slowing down a little bit. Um, I think we've stayed steady. Yeah. Fairly similar. Uh, An interesting thing when we break down that 1% increase over the past five years yeah. is 17 percent of Vermont EMS providers are below the level of EMT and we're going to kind of talk about that in the further slide but um, I think if I recall a stat it was somewhere around 400 plus of those providers are at the Vermont emergency first responder level which was created in 2020 mm -hmm. so although we've increased one percent of the approximately 2,000 something 2,000 Vermont EMS providers in reality the level of licensed providers at EMT or above has lessened. Sure. So it's kind of like a band-aid that the state's trying to provide to help these yeah. systems. It, it, it lets them have someone qualified to drive the ambulance but not and really then someone the qualified to provide care and back. Yeah. yeah. Right. right. So Centers for Medicaid <coughs> Services say in order to be able to bill for the call, so if, if there was a call right now and I grabbed Ben to go on it, and yep, he can drive, so he brings me in, I cannot bill for that call because there is only one licensed provider on the truck. So, um, Vermont came up with this idea, um, and if we move to the yeah. next slide, yeah. it'll show the different ones, to give people without the huge financial and time commitment to become, and we'll go to the third one, an EMT, just a taste of it. So you could get, it's Vermont only, it's not a nationally certified, um, it's it's a visa class, and it's it's basically a little more than your standard AHA first aid CPR class, and it can be done in 16 hours. Um, and and the thought was that if you took that class, you love it, and then continue on through the different levels. So it would be like a small um, input of time and financial costs to give it a try, basically. Yeah. We don't like that model. That's not who we regularly staff. We don't feel that they have enough training, um, but we certainly have two um, that do not run on the truck regularly, but they'll jump calls and come in and help. They'll drive a transfer. We have a transfer at 2 o'clock in the morning. We put the page out. We have a VFER. We love him. He's at 2 o'clock in the morning. He's all come in and drive that. Right. He's on our perfect. education team, comes in when we need it. Yeah. Perfect, perfect place. Um, do you want to talk about the weather? Yeah, absolutely. Did you have any questions before we got into the... I assume you're going to get to it, but I was just curious what percent of your operating budget is that uh, $10, $13 per capita versus your uh, fee reimbursement? Absolutely. We do get to that okay. in the later That's slide, fine. I believe. Yeah. Um, so like Kate was saying, with kind of that 17% of the providers that are making up the 1% increase in our overall... We like to stay at the EMT level and above. We feel that that is the best way for us to continue to provide the quality care that we really take pride in. You know, we were awarded Ambulance Service of the Year recently, and that was for the quality care we provide, some of our initiatives and creative solutions to things. So we really take pride in that. When you look at an EMT class, that's kind of the minimum level that can staff an ambulance in the back. Basic, 
level of care, bleeding control, CPR, epi for anaphylaxis, that type of stuff. When we move up, and that's 120 hours of training, and pretty much everyone does that on their own time. That's a volunteer. You choose to take a course because you want to help. And that EMT level, just to be clear, that, that, is, that is the lowest certified level that can actually do patient care. Mm -hmm. The EMR and the VFR can help on scene, and then they can drive, but they cannot do the patient care. During transport, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then the AEMT is, if you look, 120, it's 240 hours of training. So it's the kind of interim level, and it's very common in Vermont and other rural regions. Uh, in a lot of urban areas, they don't use it because it's not true ALS level of care. It's kind of like a Band-Aid. So they can start IVs, an unresponsive diabetic patient, they can start an IV and give sugar to help, you know, pretty much correct that, which is a really cool medical emergency that we can actually fix in the field. Um, they can give some meds, but pretty limited during cardiac arrest and a handful of other interventions. And then we go up to kind of the gold standard um, of pre-hospital care, which is the paramedic level license. And like Kate was saying, that typically takes two years. It is, in many cases, an associate's degree. I was able to get mine through a bachelor's degree. It takes some money to do that. The average cost in the state of Vermont is around $25,000 to do that. And that is all, in most cases, you pay out of pocket. And then you're doing the 1,500 hours of school on your own time. And then you're also expected to do at least 1,000 hours of unpaid clinicals between the hospital and that. So you look at how expensive that is and how many hours it takes, and then you look at the pay of a paramedic versus, let's say, a nurse. Nurses, in general, make more than paramedics, although the autonomy, individual decision-making and such is less than a paramedic. So not to get into the whole healthcare system, but it just kind of shows that EMS is that kind of underfunded sibling of, you know, typical healthcare that you would think of. Um, paramedics can do many things. They can do multiple forms of advanced airways, including intubation, which is definitive airway. They can do surgical airways, um, which is pretty, you know, you see it on TV, but that's something that all our paramedics are trained to do. Needle so MacGyver do something. Yeah, with a right. ballpoint yeah. pen. <laughs> <laughs> I promise we don't use a pen. With <laughs> um, needle decompressions, if a heart rate is going too fast, too slow, we can correct that with medication or electricity. There's around 40 medications that paramedics can give and a lot of advanced equipment. And again, we're the only paramedic service in the county, so not only do we cover our 10 towns, but we do paramedic intercepts for the surrounding agencies. So we are fortunate to be able to kind of provide that service to the surrounding area and our community. And it, um, just one thing to note, because I know we kind of talked a bit about like the cardiac arrest, um, when you have a paramedic on scene, uh, there is nothing the hospital can do for a cardiac arrest patient that we can't do in the field. And it is in our protocols that they don't want us transporting somebody that we have already gone through all of the steps and said that there isn't anything else we can do because there's nothing else they can do. Yeah. Um, hopefully on the other side, we've done exactly what we hoped we could do and we transport them because we got robbed. Right. Um, yeah. So we can go to the next slide. We just thought it was really important. Oh, yeah, and sorry. if you get just, just along, the, along the bottom, so we do have two VFERS. Um, we have 16 EMTs on staff. Um, one of them's a volunteer. Um, we have eight AMTs with one volunteer and nine paramedics with one volunteer. And out of all of that staff, um, we have eight full-timers um, with four <laughs> having health insurance. And increasing full-time staff would be a possible benefit of having increased per capita additional funding to kind of help with that consistency and quality of care. Um, oh, so we do have the desert map. There's the map. desert map. There you go. There it is. <laughs> yeah. Speak to that. Two slides, please. Um, so, um, yeah, just, just back at what we were talking. Um, with the 21 um, participants I got from the survey in the Vermont Ambulance <coughs> Association, that is the that is the average um, forty six dollars mm. and thirty eight cents. That doesn't account for municipalities where if it's a fire EMS based system, which I know that's comparing apples to oranges because they're offering two com you know two two services under one roof. But those for the two three I've seen the if you break it out into a per capita, it's over three hundred dollars per capita um, to offer to offer 
for both. Um, yeah. I think that's it. Wonderful. Um, Do you want to talk about our resource here? Yeah. Well, I do know we have some some graphs and learning plans. Do you want me to pass up the budget right here? Sure. So we brought along some printed out resources because I know. Do they have the budget? There are some questions regarding what the our budget is, budget where the money goes. budget is in goes. your packet. Oh, it is in their so packet. So you have the packet. We printed it out as well, but if you have it, we won't oh, walk around. Mm, that that came late this yeah, afternoon. That, that, that is not in the okay. packet. Okay. So okay. I have well, copies as well. well I'm happy. So Andy, you had a question about you know how much is, is, is payroll. Um, one of those pie charts shows yeah. us you know, pretty well what percentage of our budget. It comes from the per capita. I'm sorry, say that again? I was curious, what percent of your total revenue does the per capita make up versus your fee for service? Got it. So our operating budget is about $2.9 million, and we are getting about um, $160,000, $170,000 from municipal appropriations. Yeah. Six, 7%. And to some degree, that percent speaks to how Thanks. well we do with trying to be self-sufficient in our funding and operations. Sure. Yeah, uh, municipal taxes, six percent. So, yeah, we all. Any questions of the breakdown as we kind of look through this? So that is a mix of um, our um, fundraising grants. Um, make sure is it a subscription program? That would be the subscription program, um, our winter campaign. Which responds like to the mailings that we send out. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we do. We do. Well, two, I don't want to say two drives, but we do two bulk mailings. Um, one will come out in January, and that is our winter campaign, um, just looking for general donations. And then we send one out in June for the subscription. So um, I don't know if you are familiar with those. If not, I can speak to it. I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the municipal appropriations where you only took in 10000 <laughs> It's because of when people pay. Um, and this was, yeah. Um, so this is like looking at like one of our town reports where this is partial year yeah, versus partial year. what yeah. they've. So the other half of your budget is really good. Yeah, correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. And it's same same deal like when we're paying like school taxes, and right? Yeah. All of a sudden we pay those school taxes and it Ooh. changes the yeah, picture of our. Absolutely. Yeah. Is the budget for January to June or is it for that time period, July to December? No, the July to December is showing actual year to date. The budget is July to June, right? That's whole year budget? Yeah. I believe, right? Can't be. Wait, you can't I'm sorry, be that far off the on your budget on revenues and expenses. It looks like it's a half ask, year budget. Ask Kate the question again. It does. She can it does this like this is year. a half year budget. That's is that for January? Yeah. Is, okay. it, is that for the period that you have actual data, or is that your January to June budget? That is July through December. Okay, so you had budgeted to have the municipal appropriations but we haven't paid you yet for instance mm -hmm. I, I think with I think with some of that um, because again there's never a hard fast this is exactly when we're expecting it um, I think that we had budgeted that we would get it for the year and probably by the time I got this from Darlene at the end of December some of what was out there hadn't come in but that that's just shy of what we're expecting. The 209. So your communication center is a pretty good deal for you. Um, it, it is. Um, 
the I know I know we'll go into executive session to discuss some finances, okay. but I would love to. We don't have to unless you want to. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it, you were more comfortable having it done that way. So we're, we're fine doing it that way. Okay. Any other questions? I have some yeah, questions please. or some comments. So um, going back to the conversation about contracts. Mm -hmm. um, so from my perspective, in my history with the town, anytime we get into a situation where we're dealing with a contract, the contract is negotiated. It is not like, um, you know, like you gave the paving example, right? If we're gonna go out to paving, we're gonna put that out to bid, right? In this particular case, it would be a situation of a, um, what do we call it? One, only one sole, oper source. sole source, right? Because there's not oper other opportunities for us. But we would still have the opportunity, if it's a contract, to negotiate that. We wouldn't be presented with, here's what you're gonna pay. So from our perspective, or my perspective, I should say, um, when we're presented with a contract, it, it, it felt a little, um, it felt a little not, not good, right? Because if you want a contract, then we should have been approached that you wanted to go that way and we should have a, we should be able to negotiate, right? Because we negotiate contracts for, everything. you know, unions, <laughs> for, <laughs> you know, yeah. for, for everything, you know, for, for cameras, for our police, you know, our water metering equipment. We have contracts for all kinds of things, but we're able to negotiate those things, right? Sure. So I just wanted to, to just mm. explain that from, from our perspective a little bit, what, what I, oh, I shouldn't say our perspective, I should say my perspective because I'm only speaking from me and my experience, so. It makes, it makes sense and we heard it from other communities. Um, I think the messaging around our intent was lacking and I apologize for that. Um, regrettably, you know, we don't feel like there is a whole lot of room for negotiation with individual communities. Yeah. We're not going to charge a different rate to different towns, right? right. It just wouldn't be equitable. Right. Um, but your point is well taken. Yeah. yeah. I, and and uh, we don't have to go back and forth on it. I just wanted to share a little bit about the, the feeling around that word, I guess, is maybe. Yeah. Um, maybe, uh, um, yeah, uh, like I was trying to articulate, the, the thought behind it might have been to streamline things between the 10 towns. Um, to change the relationship to the towns that um, are going to take it and put it out onto the floor. Um, I, I don't want um, a, a town to be without an ambulance service because they didn't understand all of what we're explaining here. We wanted to change the relationships that we have with the select board so we could say this is what's going on, you know, come to our meeting, we'll tell you what we're doing. Um, you know, we feel good about what we're doing. We want to say, like, hey, we're giving you a great deal. Um, just keep supporting us, you know, and, and here's why we need to ask a little bit more this year. Um, I didn't want to not be standing outside somewhere collecting signatures um, so we could be put on the ballot. So that was more the intent where, I mean, I, we sort of feel like it's been an unwritten contract. You know, we ask the towns for some money, we're put in there, and, and we do and provide the services to the town. Um, I think again, reframing that being, it as a fee for service being, agreement is okay. you know, that, a, a that, very streamlined that, way to handle it. Yeah, right? that being said. It so what happens if a town doesn't do a fee for service or a contract or whatever, you guys can't not provide the service, right? No, we, we, we would not provide the service. So if the town of Middlebury said, I'm sorry, we're not, it basically means that our well, it means it, it, it would mean you would you would likely be compelled to go to Virgins or Bristol and see if they would provide the service and find out the rates at which they would do it. Um, so, from for me and my limited, you know, knowledge of how all these things work, it sounds to me like we should have you as a municipal service, like we have a police department, like we have a fire department. So and that you should, ha your people should be employees of our town, you know, like. 
But how, how then do we handle that equitably with 10 different towns? Yeah. Right? I, I don't know. I, I don't I don't certainly don't have all the answers. But but do, mm. do you see what I like? Yeah. It we feels do. like a municipal service. Yep. In, in the large, dense metropolitan areas of the state, it tends to be a municipal service. Okay. Outside of that, in the rural areas, it is not. I just wonder if there would be some cost savings in offering benefits and packages if if we had the power of you know a larger employer often has you know more capacity to, to so those are just things that I'm thinking about um, can I quick piggyback on that Heather mm, sure <laughs> um, I was wondering what level of coordination there is among the county providers right you've got Brandon Virgens Bristol and yourselves um, are there we do a lot of backup for them okay um, and not a lot of like trying to your, your territory is fairly well defined you're not poaching transport between here and there and getting all so uh, no so our areas are strictly defined but we do provide mutual aid to services so should we be out on two 911 calls and a third one comes in nobody answers the radio Bristol comes in okay. mm -hmm. um, Vice versa with Bristol or any of those other regions, if their ambulances are busy, we would respond to assist them. Okay. The the problem comes in, which you know has been the case for services now and again, and and very fortunately not Middlebury, is that we wind up becoming their primary service because they can't get coverage. So they let us know that they're out of service for 48 hours because they can't staff their ambulance, and then. We're all taking we're all taking a part of their service area. Right, so that first. takes the four staffed ambulances in the county down to three, and it's a very limited resources. Like granted, some people can come in who aren't on shift, but it's a finite resource that can be depleted quickly. But we have been working with kind of the leadership of some of the other agencies. Some are more interested than others, and just kind of like communicating with like, hey, like what are our futures? How can we help each other? So there's a lot of conversation and a lot of different levels and a lot of different ideas for the future yeah exactly, there is an organizational exactly like structure. there's 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 um there's ems districts in the state heather um that coordinate uh each of the departments underneath them and then coordinate together to try and achieve a lot of the things that you're mm -hmm. talking about right um it, it's not as though we're floating alone yeah, yeah. and uh, i don't you know and i don't know you know i'm just I'm just talking about some of the things that I'm thinking uh, about. Not that I know anything about anything. I'm just Those are common <laughs> topics. No, but about it, I mean, but to your to your it? point right there, though, Heather. I mean, I had um, I had lunch with the heads of service with Virgens and Bristol, and we kind of sat down and and said, okay, you know, what's everybody needing right now? So, I, you, you know, without getting into a whole lot of medication, we had a premixed uh, Kalinox. Um, we all need to buy mixer valves now, and they're Thirty-six hundred dollars each, and I'm like, what do we need to do to get together to buy these all together? Um, so we we're cost, starting right? those discussions. To your point, like uh, maybe not municipal, but like as a county service areas, is there some things we could get together for buying state power? Can buy that on state bids, right? So there's uh -huh. a lot of talk, and the state has been at the state level been talking about real regionalization and stuff of emergency resources. And I think in the next eight, 10 years, there's gonna be a lot of evolution with that and a lot of opportunities. Um, and the state has been doing some purchasing. We received uh, high flow nasal cannula systems through a state purchase system to kind of roll that out to us so that we can take those critically ill patients who need that level of care. It was a piece of equipment we could not afford. We didn't provide that service, or I guess potentially could afford, but they provided it to us and we were able to roll that system out along with, I believe, a handful of other agencies receive that so there are some little things coming but it's not system-wide enough to make a big impact on budgets and um, services sure I just well, sorry yeah no no it's fine it's totally fine um, the other thing I would just say is what really struck me in the presentation when I was reviewing it is and this goes across the board I think for the whole healthcare industry is it's just not sustainable mm -hmm. and we we as a select board can we we are struggling with our budget you know and what we're asking the taxpayers to be able to afford because 
you know, as you know, living in this community, costs for everything are going up, right? Costs for everything. Um, so how do we, how do how do we be a fiscally responsible body if we can't control, you know, some of these costs? Um, and I know I, I'm, you know, I realize what's going on for you guys, but I hope that somebody is advocating somewhere to, to say that this is not sustainable. I, I don't think that you guys can keep coming back to us every year and saying we need another three, we need another four because we need to close this gap and it's constantly on the taxpayer's back. I think my answer to that is we've got to come up with a different model. Um, for this year, I think next year, maybe a third year, okay. But at that point, I'm gonna be like, no. Talk to we, your state legislators. Yeah, when we have, I think we have, <laughs> uh, you know, I th we have them in, you know, once or twice a year and we bring up stuff. Um, I, I just, I know that doesn't help you guys, but mm -hmm. I, at some point from where I'm sitting and what I have to present to the taxpayers, I'm, I'm just gonna be like, I can't do it anymore, you know? I can't, I, I can't, I can't imagine can't. reinventing the wheel either, right? Yeah. Like it's. But we have to, I don't know what, like the, the same, our healthcare costs for mm -hmm. the employees of the town are going up, you know, 15, 20% mm -hmm. a year. And it's, it's the same thing. It's not sustainable. We can't continue to, anyway. Um, on, a, on a small piece with that though, uh, you know, baby steps, right? I feel like with the whole healthcare industry and insurance reimbursements, it's like trying to, it's like trying to turn a cruise ship, but, um, as of July with the fee schedules we showed you, um, Medicare rates, Medicaid had its own separate rate, which was way less than that. And they did put into rule, and I think it went in as of July 1st of last of 23, that the Medicaid rate is now the same as the Medicare. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, where that sounds like a little bit, you know, that $750 fee schedule that we showed for ALF2, if it was a Medicaid, would have been $350, $400. So, I mean, where it sounds like a baby step, that's like, hey, you know, I mean, somebody realized that that's not enough. Especially mm -hmm. in an aging community like us. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. It's a lot of difference in your income. In, in the community like, uh, in the communities like Burlington, it's got a hospital right there. Does Burlington have its own uh, ambulance system or are they run Combo the fire and fire and it's, it's under fire? Yeah, if you look at any of these large municipalities though, you'll see, although they all say they're firefighter paramedics, they're paramedic firefighters. The majority of these call volumes are EMS based. Mm -hmm. um, they have the big red expensive trucks, but a lot of what <laughs> we're doing is, as fire based EMS is just EMS. Um, so, Big expensive red truck. Right, it's, it's yeah. an unpopular opinion with uh -huh. firefighters. But it's, it's the reality of EMS <laughs> systems. Okay. Yeah, I, I, a couple things. Um, um, with what Heather said, you know, we've got a fire department, we've got a police department, we've got an ambulance, so we've got an ambulance service and a hospital. That's part of a triad. We, we, need, we need to have this. And, and that's why a lot of people come to live in this town, mm -hmm. is because we have, because we have these people. Yep. So, we're not, growing that, we're not growing that fast on, on, we're not growing on population right now. We need to build some no, houses. No, no, I agree, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna say some, you know, Go let, ahead. Let, let, me, let me continue. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, what they're asking for is kind of a big jump, but it's not necessarily out of line with other things that we've been dealing with. I had the same concerns that Heather did with, with the way you approached us, and mm -hmm. that kind of set me off really big time on this. Um, um, but uh, I, you know, I've never partaken of your services, and I don't plan to. <laughs> but you know, to, to, to compliment you, you're a valuable asset. From everything I've heard in the community, you're doing a great job. But we just need to, to just we need to have some input in what's going on. Another part of the contract that has really concerned me is there's escalation clauses in there that we don't we're not negotiating. Mm -hmm. You can do them at any time. And, and we need we need to have that contract say that there's we have control over the we negotiate with you over those mm -hmm. escalation charges just from what Heather has said. Mm -hmm. Well, Dan, again, that's why we, that's one of the reasons we're going to get rid of the contract and just do a fee for service agreement. Okay. Um, but again, like 
we can't negotiate with individual towns on the rate we're charging. We can't charge Middlebury a lower rate than we're going to charge Orwell or Salisbury or someone else. So, you know, I, I understand your point about wanting to, you know, ha have some influence over, you know, how, how, how the service agreement is, is arranged. We're not trying to gouge you. We're offering you a pretty good deal relative to what's happening in the rest of the state. Um, we're not going to be able to offer different terms to different municipalities. I, I understand that, but, but early on in the year, you need to be talking to her about sure. what the plans are so when we come in the budget process, we get in a position in the budget process where we can help accommodate it instead of deep into where we're at. Absolutely. So would October 1st be? The deceptive work of that. Well, but I'd, I'd when like do you want to go to the other towns? Uh, I mean, the bottom line is Middlebury is your lion's share. And if Middlebury votes it down, yeah. I don't see you sustaining an ambulance service without doing calls to Middlebury and being able to bill them and whatnot. Uh, Look at what happened in Brattleboro. Well, <laughs> yeah. I don't think that we want to go there, right? So rather than come out and say this is, I think back to Heather's, it ought to be a negotiation, a discussion. <laughs> if you see us as a, as a client as opposed to a partner, then, then you ought to come <coughs> to us earlier on. Don't come to us with this is it or, or we're not gonna, if you guys vote it down, we're not gonna give calls on you. That is a bullshit way to do business. And the way, and that's the whole point I think that everybody wants to make. It's, we were pretty set off with the, it's this or nothing and that's, not the way we do business and it's not the way i'm sure you wanted to do business sounds like you've kind of got the word as you've been out that that's not the way the other towns want to either um, but i'd like to get into our executive session mm -hmm. personally yeah. um and and uh, it's been a great we, conversation with the night is uh it has getting along with too if i could just add one more quick thing so maybe we don't negotiate but we have some conversation and if it's it needs to be an executive session because we can do that for contracts but let's let's have some conversation about what you need and mm -hmm. and how we can work together and you know let's before just coming and saying the you know what i mean like absolutely let, can we can we try to work together to, to get you guys what we need make sure that we're fiscally responsible to our taxpayers and we're doing the best we can on our budget to keep our tax rates reasonable um, let, let's just try to make it a uh, two-way street as much as we can. It's been very widespread and received that yeah. the initial rollout of that wasn't perceived as it was meant to be. One of the tasks that it's we it's talked okay. about. You know, we're all learning here. Yeah. It's, Absolutely. You know, we're gonna, we want to move I, forward. We were just going to say. I, I did want to make this a, a more simplified yeah. thing yeah. to change and, the and relationship guys to the select boards, and that's not what happened. Yeah, <laughs> and when talking about the role development, for me, when I took over in the deputy director role, that was one of our big things was working on preparing presentations, even if it's once a year, if you guys have a month that's good for us to come in and share our call volume, share kind of what we've been up to, just to be that partnership that you guys are looking for so that you know about us, we know about you, and we can kind of talk about what's coming down the pipeline and in terms of our struggles, and you can kind of anticipate how we can help, how you can help, s stuff like and that. I think we want to help. We want to be good part, like mm -hmm. we want to do what we can to support you, but we also have a responsibility too to the taxpayers. So, absolutely, you know, we we're, we yeah, got to balance that the best we can. So. We're both tasked with being fiscally yeah. responsible to right. the communities we serve. So, but anyway, yeah. you know, if I, once I, you get done your year end and you know what your budget is for the next year, you're probably already working. I mean, we don't have to wait till our budget process mm -hmm. for you to ask to come in and sit down with us and say this is what it's looking like but uh, absolutely when you when you got that 13 cent uh, letter came to us in maybe september when did it, it's been came to us quite a while ago right end of october it made of april august sorry end of yeah. august yeah i guess it, it, the meeting in know, october yeah because we sent it to the attorney to review and and uh, had provided you kind of our draft comments uh, it, it did come with an invitation to come meet with us, right? It, and and, and <laughs> there, there were a here, few representatives. Ben, ben, here's the question. Who, who's, the, who's the customer? <laughs> when I want to meet with a customer of mine, I go, I, I go, I don't say, hey, you, you want my, you know, 
Absolutely. If you want our bu business, then then the, the invitation I, should have been the other way around. I do know. We'd like to come see you. Not if you've got time on our board meeting nights, come see us. And that's what we'd hope we, to do in the future. We, yes. Again, uh, this is an all learning thing, and with the struggles, I reached out to two of the larger ambulance services in the state and asked them what they did, and they said, here's a sample of the contract, <laughs> and this is what we do. <laughs> it's like, like, so I tried to take some advice some, with you know, some successful That's ambulance right. services and tried to follow a little bit of suit. They're like, invite everybody to a meeting, send them a sample, say this is what you're looking at, invite them to come talk to you, and Okay, let's, well, let's learned. learned. We'll, we'll, we'll move forward, right? We'll move forward and try to figure it out. So. So we do, I do appreciate you <laughs> and all you do for the community and I don't want that, you know. I shouldn't be lost in the whole process. So yes. Uh, this is one of those deals. Finance is one thing, your performance on the operational side and as a community pillar is noteworthy and it doesn't, this discussion is more contentious than it, than it needed to be. So um, we got to give Dave a seat for a moment before we can get into uh, <laughs> the next phase. All right, I'll be brief. Our timeline was optimistic. We've got to do warrants too. Mm -hmm. I know. Okay. That's quick. <laughs> that doesn't take long. <laughs> so we thought it would be good to just give a, a, a brief update on what the town's uh, restarted policy review committee has done. Um, the group had its second meeting um, this past month. Um, the first one was, was uh, back at the very end of October. Um, as you might remember, this was restarted back in the summer with a revised scope to allow the the town to have a forum and the select board uh, to have a forum not just to occasionally review operational policies but when an issue comes up um, that's kind of broad and and more public policy related that this may not be the best forum to have a large sort of scale discussion but rather if there's research that needs done if there's facts that needs gathering uh, another group could could get into the weeds um, and present back to you um, and the idea was that the, the concerns or the ideas would come from the select board generally down to the group. So they're not, um, it's not anecdotal. It's not purely one person who may be louder than the rest who says we need to talk about X or Y or Z, but rather the board is interested in, in digging in. So, you know, part of the benefits of that is it, it can save this board a lot of time. Um, it can also, if we do research and find out that, hey, this issue really isn't, uh, we don't think it's worthy of acting upon, it can prevent, um, over something that maybe isn't as relevant as it needs to be. Um, so at any rate, we've dug into a number of topics. Uh, we've obviously picked the chair and we've, we're gonna be meeting on a monthly basis. Um, and uh, some of the earlier topics that you may have heard about um, was uh, first relating to short-term rental units and, and there's a memo on the website you can read about that talking about the degree to which that's actually impacting the town of Marlboro relative to the rest of the state. Um, and it's, you can read about it, but it's, it's it's not nearly the issue that you'll find in the sea towns and in Burlington. Um, it's, a, it's part of the housing discussion, but not necessarily um, overwhelming the housing market here. The trend line is, is, is uh, pretty neutral and the numbers are low to begin with. Um, some other topics that came up that were raised um, relate to the, the town's winter parking ban. It's something that we looked into a little bit. Nearly every town in the state has a ban. You know, it's pretty logical. Don't park on the street at night in case it snows. Somebody might need to do some plowing. Um, and they don't have to push your car out of the way. A um, couple towns have some variations, but we, we took a look at what those towns do and also the degree to which we've received any complaints. And I think um, you know, we've, we, we sort of have a, a practical solution. There is a the town, as you might remember, created some exempt sites on the streets, on Pleasant Street, to give some folks who may live in some of the, what you call densest areas of Middlebury who may not have off-street parking a place to park. So we think that was a pretty suitable solution without changing any policy. Some of the others that somebody raised relates to um, 
uh, security cameras. I know there was discussion earlier this fall about that in the public space. So not just on the police officer's persons or the building, but rather um, if the town should pursue that. And there is funding, I think, proposed in this budget for potential cameras. Um, uh, uh, somebody raised to the manager's office about whether a policy should be in place on how the how the cameras are handled and, and who can watch them and things like that. Um, so it's without trying to reinvent the wheel, we just reached out to a few of the larger towns in Vermont and asked them if they have a policy that we can review. Um, there are two topics that I wanted to raise in the spirit of having them come to you before the, the committee acts on them um, that were suggested by some of the new members of the committee. Um, and uh, w one of them is the naming of public spaces. Um, as you can, I'm sure you can appreciate, oftentimes towns and cities will rename parks, bridges, buildings, you name it, park benches. Um, and there can be a desire to, um, uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, have a process for that, where the ideas come from, who approves them. Um, uh, it's not the most controversial thing in the world, you know, compared to some other issues, but it is a, a worthwhile policy. So when somebody knocks on the door, it's not just, uh, sure, let's vote on it tomorrow and call it a day. Um, it, can, it can be quite simple. Um, it could just be, you know, a one-page policy that simply lays out how it works. Um, but uh, we thought that might be something you'd want to send to the committee formally. The other one um, we just talked about a, a few days ago, um, the placement of religious objects on public property. It's a little more of a constitutional question, maybe. Um, but it's something that if this uh, comes up again, we have some sort of process. Um, the LCT's done some good work explaining the constitutional law um, in that area. Um, but I think, uh, I don't know if I came along, we've had a couple communications maybe on that topic um, from the public. So uh, finding a policy that is lawful, obviously, but allows people to, to, to make their requests if that's where, um, what the town wants to do. So those would both be things that if you're okay with it, the committee would dive into. Um, I would do the research ahead of time to kind of give the committee um, some facts and figures, um, and we'll see whether something can come back to this group. So that's a long-winded, uh, quick summary <laughs> of and, topics. And, and thoughts on presentation for policy uh, change proposals. Do a white paper? Yeah, or so I, I don't want to yeah. eat a ton of time because you guys are already going to spend a lot of time. Yeah. Is there a, a, a good flow way that could be presented to us that we could look at it and we could ask if we have questions, but if we don't, yeah. that we could maybe... I think uh, it would be a little bit more expeditiously. I think if, if a topic is, is cycled through the board and there's decisions to not recommend anything, we can very pretty easily write up a quick little summary of, of why we're suggesting to not act. In the case where we are suggesting, um, I think um, the, the work product would, would come in the form of a memo. And if, and if there's a, you know, a, a draft of a policy that we would bring back to you, that way when you're discussing it, you can see what's the, what a draft might look like and then also how we got there. Um, and we would probably just put that either in a memo or in, the, or in the agenda notes, but something that explains how we got to that point and who we looked at to, to kind of inform ourselves. You know, the good news with a lot of these things is almost nothing is, is unique to Middlebury in this regard. A lot of these policies are things that other places are already tackling. So, but that would probably be a written form coming back to you. Question? Yeah, question. Um, some of the things that you're dealing with or will do will will have um, it might be a little bit of the purview of other committees that are already standing committees yeah public health and safety yeah so I, th I, I personally think that you should coordinate with those committees sure. also so we yeah. we uh, we, we've already on some of these have asked for input so for example with the winter parking we ended up mm -hmm. having discussions with Bill from Public Works because who would know better about sort of the practical and operational side of that issue? We don't want to do anything in a vacuum. Um, and I think in the instances where, like you said, where it overlaps, um, you know, it's better to get everyone's input and present one thing um, rather than coming at it, you know, having it go to another committee and then another committee. So. For example, you're working with the Energy Committee on right. the renewable uh, no, 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 vehicle no, no, no. Yeah. 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 policy. Had okay. a good discussion with Bill and uh, representatives from that committee to make sure that whatever the abstract goals of the energy committee are that they're realizing the reality of what bill or, or is facing when they're going out to purchase vehicles right and the, to avoid having a policy that can't get past the practical hurdles of the vehicle industry um, 
So that's an example of putting those two together um, and then hopefully coming out with a, another product that is a little more useful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, on the question of whether we should um, ask the committee to review these two things, um, I think the naming of public spaces is great because I think that has come up as something like we should have some mm. systematic way of doing that. So I, I would be in favor of asking the committee to look into that a little further. Came up just recently on uh, when Lazarus. Victor passed. Yeah, when yeah. Victor, when uh, Victor and then we struggled with it on the Lazarus Park. Yeah, because mm -hmm. um, we felt like we should have some process that sure. we'd go through, you know. Because was yeah. there some other name that we weren't considering, but this was the one that was presented to us. So anyway, um, on the religious objects on property, uh, public property, that kind of reminds me of the, the discussion we had about, was it art? So something that had to do with free speech that we decided to decline considering opening up that box and as David said there has been there's legal decisions interpretations in that I think it would be nice to have synthesized and brought to the board um, okay. for uh, a thorough consideration yeah. so I'm just it just sounded similar to, to yeah. things we've decided to to not open the door to in the past so that was my only feedback on that one and that could very well be the outcome you know, okay. I mean, that, that there's nothing wrong with n not acting on it, you know, if yeah. the okay. uh, come down. So in that case, it's, for me, it's fine if we get some more information. Let's keep that committee busy. <laughs> <laughs> Enthusiastic group. We had a handy, <laughs> handy yeah. Yeah. It was great. I uh, was in the unfortunate position of needing to be at work that day and had to, uh, I had to try to chair the meeting as a Zoom attendee, <laughs> oh, which yeah. is awkward as can be when you can't uh, easily right scan there. faces and see what's <laughs> going on. But yeah, it was it was much better um, conversation than I expected going in. I thought it was great. So do you need some? Do we need to to do something formal? I think that's enough. In I think we'll, we'll we have we'll we'll take that <laughs> get going on it. Sounds like a vote of confidence, Dave. All righty. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's got check warrants? I have check warrants. They look awesome. Shout out to our <laughs> finance department. Rock Let's pay our bills. I move to approve total expenditures in the amount of $599,032.12, consisting of $469,299 and 89 cents for accounts payable and $129,732.23 for payroll for the period of December 20th, 2023 through January 9th, 2024. And a fire chief does the same thing. <laughs> Every time he sits in here. Uh, I'll second that. Did someone else do it already? No, I'll I think second that's it. you. Moved and seconded. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We lost Lindsay at some point. Was there was there a comment? A chat. A chat. Check the chat. Oh, she needed to leave early. Pay somebody to do that. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you for being here. We do. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. They just set you up. <laughs> okay, select board member concerns. No, none. Love the new website. Yeah. Looks great. I'll, I'll second that one. Yeah? No, I'm good. I'm good. Good. We got no Lindsay. Um, I do have something I'm going to be super quick. Um, I heard that there was some tax status problem about Turning Point going into the St. Mary's school. Um, I had never heard that as part of this body, and I was wondering what that was. Remember when Turning Point came to convert yeah. the St. Mary's School? Yeah. And, oh, oh. and I was there talking was to a parishioner who was telling me that there was some legal complication. I had just never heard that, and I was just looking for a little 
they clarification were. on what happened there. Hmm. Um, I mean, that fell apart, and they're and they and they're renovating the building. Yeah, they came back. They were, they were upset at something because they didn't feel it was their fault. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I didn't know what that was, and I was asked about it and could not answer, and now I'm asking. Okay. Um, it sounds it sounds familiar. I don't remember. Yeah, that's the fine. Details. Yeah, yeah I expected exactly that. Um, I had the misfortune of spending time at Porter um, the other night, um, not for myself, but I was absolutely amazed at mm -hmm. the quality of care and everyone working there, including the ambulance folks coming in. And I see the police and fire and charter house around and observe them more regularly and know how awesome they are. And it was just an expansion of my view of all of the good, hardworking people that make this town so awesome, um, including uh, homeless support while I was there, which was delivered to difficult people in the most compassionate way I could imagine. And thirdly, I see that there's a DEI meeting uh, about welcome materials to the town, and I'm hoping that that comes to us in our next packet. Okay. Any interest to get on to the uh, executive session? <laughs> yeah. Who's ready? I'm ready. Cheryl? In accordance with Vermont's open meeting law requirements, I move that the board find that premature general knowledge of the consideration of contractual, contractual matters would clearly place the select board at a substantial disadvantage because the select board risks disclosing its strategy if it discusses the contracts in public. I like how I can just put any word I want in there. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I further move that the board enter into executive session to discuss the contractual matters under the provisions of Title I, Section 313A1 of the Vermont Statutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We go into executive session 934.